Hey there, I'm Dan Maltrup, talking with Josh Stacker, Kent State University a professor of political science. A professor or assistant professor? Assistant professor. Assistant professor of political science. And we're talking about Josh's new book. It's called Adaptable Autocrats, Regime Power in Egypt and Syria, um, which is coming out when, Josh? Uh, I think it's going to be able to be ordered from Amazon on April 5th, but I think the official launch date is April 25th. Fantastic. Congratulations. I know this was Thank not a, a, an easy book to produce. would not be an easy book to produce in normal times, much less uh, uh, when you're doing last-minute rewrites in 2011. So let's start with the title. What's an adaptable autocrat? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the, the, the idea from the, the title really came out of, of the, my participation in the authoritarian durability literature. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it, it was the idea that, that you know, the, the, the literature really sets it up as in terms of you have authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes, and they get kind of frozen in these two dichotomies. And, and so what I wanted to do is break that duality a little bit and, and, and say, like, you know, look, there are these autocratic regimes um, that, that are, you know, very nasty, but they're not clumsy regimes. They're not stupid regimes. They also have the capacity to change and react to their situations. And that um, within that respect, some of these regimes are able to adapt better than other ones. So mm -hmm. that's really the core premise of the book was to kind of look at Egypt and Syria and, mm -hmm. and make an argument for why Egypt was a little little bit more of a cohesive authoritarian regime that was able to respond to um, external shocks, internal shocks, um, um, and, and changes to its atmosphere uh, in a ways that the Syrian regime never was very good at. So let me, let me just jump back for a second. When you say there was this dichotomy, this duality between dem democratic regimes and autocratic regimes, um, are you, were you essentially the way it's been described is that you know democratic regimes good autocratic regimes bad like that's pretty much the way political science has viewed this yeah absolutely and and you know in that respect um you know the the entire transition literature was all about how do you get an authoritarian regime to get to a democracy it's very linear in its thinking it's very spatial in its thinking and so um you know the idea behind this was that authoritarian regimes have been the most popular form of government in the history of, of, of human civilization. So, um, you know, democracy is not really the norm. Authoritarianism is the norm. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one reason why I was interested in, in studying authoritarianism. And then, you know, there's the other aspect to it, right? I mean, um, sometimes in autocracies, authoritarian leaders do really democratic or inclusive things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. they do very authoritarian things. And also, sometimes in democracies, by nature of how they're set up, I mean, they have to do autocratic things sometimes. So, you know, I think we have to be really careful about these kind of, um, you know, mentalities of how we think about things, um, because it really can skew our analysis and how we think about um, um, governance in the 21st century. So let's get specific, though, about Egypt and Syria. I mean, you, you make the claim in the book that um, Egypt's uh, that Egypt was this, you know, authoritarian, very adaptable authoritarian regime, except 2011 kind of fell apart. So how adaptable was the Mubarak regime? Well, I mean, actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, we haven't seen a transition to democracy in Egypt. Um, and what we're seeing is authoritarian re-entrenchment, actually. So, um, and, and, and in terms of what's in place in Egypt, um, we've seen the ruling coalition get changed, but mm -hmm. um, many of the former agents that were active during the Mubarak years remain active in Egypt and remain part of the ruling coalition in Egypt. So, Are you, you know what about we really. Staff? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, all those generals on the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces mm -hmm. were appointed by Mubarak. Many of the people in Parliament, um, you know, were were in Parliament under Mubarak. A lot of the ministers, technocrats. Um, these are all sort of Mubarak legacies. Even the way that the economy is being sort of manipulated at this point is, mm -hmm. is very sort of Mubarak-esque. Mm -hmm. um, you could make the argument that the Muslim Brotherhood are new on the coalition. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, they're new members of the ruling coalition. But they accepted the, the logic of the regime uh, of SCAF, and they accepted that, you know, if they want to be in power and they want to have access to power, they're going to have to mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, develop this uh, very exclusive elite 
political arena mm -hmm. um, that isn't really reacting or responding in any meaningful way to the demands of the protesters that mm -hmm. were made in 2011. So what we're really looking at is not really regime change uh -huh. in 2011 in Egypt, but a, a change in the ruling coalition uh -huh. of that regime. So they cut off the head, but the body remained intact. And so would the outcome of the upcoming presidential election alter your analysis at all? No, because the the <laughs> such a Egyptian bummer, Josh. I mean, I want change. <laughs> we want like you know, you want you want to know that like the 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 deposing of a of a, you know of an alleged democratic president who wasn't a democratic president actually matters. But you're saying it doesn't. No, actually, it really doesn't. I mean, because yeah. the way that the generals and, 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 and through Western participation through international financial institutions like the IMF, uh, the U.S., mm -hmm. the EU, they've all conditioned continual Egyptian aid to the promotion of neoliberal economic reforms. So what they're doing is they're participating in helping condition an arena mm -hmm. um, that helps the, the military anchor its vast economic empires in ways that they become immovable. And so it doesn't really matter um, who runs the show or who's elected into the representative parliament. Um, the people that are really running the country aren't actually ever going up for uh, election or will never appear on a ballot. And the U.S., through all of these economic, international economic agencies, is basically supporting that and not only supporting it but advocating it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, and this is what makes the NGO... Um, tussle that we've witnessed over the past you know month and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it looks like it's this very dramatic scene, right? Like, is Egypt is America going to lose Egypt? Mm -hmm. When the fact of the matter is, they're not going to lose Egypt um, because a lot of that aid is tied up in um, you know uh, American industries. Mm -hmm. So you know Egypt produces more Abrams tanks. Um, than then, uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America combined, mm -hmm. okay? And where they get most of those parts are from Lima, Ohio. So do you think the representative in Congress is going to cut aid to Egypt? Because if he does, he's basically, um, you know, destroying jobs in his constituency. Mm -hmm. So the aid doesn't really become about democracy and democracy workers or democracy promoters living in Egypt. It becomes about jobs and sort of American economy. So... I mean, there, there's, a, there's a bigger story here, and, um, um, and, and so w I think the way we have to think about this is American participation or Western participation, if you want to be more broad about it, mm -hmm. is not to so much focus on what they're saying, but focus mm -hmm. very much on what they're doing. How come the media and others aren't telling this story? Why is this story so hidden? You know, I don't think it's that hidden. I think it's just a way of thinking about things, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the action is the protesters. We can see it. We can see repression. We can see tear gas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can see brutality. So um, we can see elections, right? So people gravitate to what they can see and what they can measure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and, and you know, it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of time and, and a special kind of reporter to kind of stand through and... I sift through all these candidates and elections and get mm -hmm. that story out. But the problem is, you know, I mean, it may not be, it may not be, you know, the, the, the most overt story going on. There's underlying currents, right, transnational currents mm -hmm. that are transferring capital and, you know, repression and all these, these sorts of things that we can be focusing on. All right. Well, you talked about things we can see like um, violence and repression and, um, um, things of that sort that make me think of like Syria. So let's talk about Syria for a second, where that's all you see lately. Um, Bashar Assad has remained in power through a tumultuous year, which on the face of it would say to an uninformed observer like me, he looks like a pretty adaptable guy, even though he's resorting to violence. Um, you're saying he's not adaptable at all, and violence is the, the fact that he's resorted to violence is a sign of his eventual downfall. Yeah, I mean, the, the sign of the, okay, so, you know, it goes back to this old Hannah Arendt quote, right? Wherever you have violence in, 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 in power, where, where you have violence, you don't have power, and where you have power, you don't have violence. Uh-huh. Right? So the idea that we can have Egypt, right, there's 18 days of protest, and, and you know, people want to follow Mubarak, and that regime is able to kind of 
shift and remake its ruling coalition on the fly during a crisis mm -hmm. and then sort of, you know, re recreate itself right. um, in a way that it stops the protesters, the protesters go home. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and look, uh, you know, and they do it, they do it by sacrificing Mubarak essentially. Absolutely. Right. So in Syria, you have a, a, a much more decentralized executive arena. And what I mean by that is the executive is actually, you know, um, interacting with the military and the intelligence officer, uh, intelligence agencies. It's interacting with the party in ways that Mubarak never had to because he existed in a centralized you know, political field. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what that means in a sort of decentralized arena like in Syria is that on day-to-day -day politics of it all, um, you know, there's a lot of turf guarding going on. Mm -hmm. But if the threat or if the challenge becomes existential to the regime, then what it does, because they don't have that a sort of adaptable quality to kind of remake the ruling coalition, mm -hmm. um, they can't sacrifice anybody up. So mm -hmm. what they, it forces them to band together mm -hmm. and then, you know, fight their way out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, any time that they're using violence is, is a sign that politically they're pretty weak. And so in, in, in sort of my language of the book, right, it would be mm -hmm. that, um, you know, they're, they're less adaptable. Mm-hmm. I don't quite understand this idea of like centralization and decentralization. What do you mean by, you know, what does that actually mean? Because if, okay. if the, visibly, it looks as if both, that as if there's not much difference between um, uh, the Mubarak presidency and the current Assad presidency. There's a president who's in power who believes he's got pretty much ultimate power. That seems like centralized power to me, but I don't know what I'm talking about, so in, help me. Oh, no. Um, so, so here's the idea, right? I mean, if you look at Egypt and Syria, this was one of the reasons why I picked both of these cases all the way back in like 2002 or 2003 when I thought about this project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was very much, you know, Syria and Egypt had been one country between 1958 and 1961. Um, the, you know, uh, the, 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 they both were single party states. Their constitutions look similar. Mm -hmm. they, both the presidents were, you know, fighter pilots, right? There was mm -hmm. all these sort of, uh, you know, they were both authoritarian regimes. But um, after I'd lived in Egypt for about four or five years um, and I went to Damascus to live there and I was living in Damascus, I was finding like they look complete, they, 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 the behavior of the regimes was completely different. Mm -hmm. Things that you could get away with in Damascus, you could never get away with in Cairo, and things that you could do in Egypt, you could never do in Syria. Uh -huh. So um, I, that was a, kind of the core driving um, um, idea behind the book. Give me and, an example. Give me an example. Like, what could you do? What What would be the thing you would get away with in Syria that you couldn't do in Egypt, or vice versa? Oh yeah, sure. So so um, um, there's this vote right in 2003 at the United Nations Security Council. Syria was one of the temporary, uh, you know. Um, members on the council. And so resolution 1483, I think it is, comes up and that's going to be the resolution that where they're going to um, um, justify or legitimate the U.S. occupation of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So the Syrian regime like gets this information and they have to have a vote on it. So they take it to the Ba'ath Party Regional Command, which is the highest organ in the Ba'ath Party. Mm -hmm. And basically Bashar sends word that he wants to vote for this resolution. He does not want problems because there was a terrible precedent with Yemen in mm -hmm. 1990 mm -hmm. rejecting U.S. resolutions. Uh, and so Bashar says that he wants to vote yes. Well, a couple of the sort of older Ba'athists on uh, who had a lot of power all say they want to vote no. So mm -hmm. they take a vote and it's like twenty-one to three on the regional command to vote for the resolution. Mm -hmm. They send word to the UN ambassador in New York, like go vote yes. Well, the next morning, you know, the UN ambassador gets a, a phone call in um, from the foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, there was a mistake, we're to vote no on this. So Faisal Makdad, who's, you know, just a sort of bureaucrat, mm -hmm. is sitting there going, okay, do I vote yes or no? So he doesn't, he tries to call the president, he can't get a hold of Basid, so he doesn't go to the vote. <laughs> um, and, and, and so once Bashar finds out that he doesn't go to the vote, he calls Faisal Makdad, and I was like, what are you doing? Go vote. And Faisal Makdad shows up, and he, he actually is trying, he's protesting to get Syria's vote counted. And finally, you know, it shows up in the UN records, like Syria officially abstained. Uh-huh. Uh, 
Um, and and when they interviewed Faisal Macdad after this, he he basically said in the newspapers, "Well, we we were just having a little bit of a problem, and and had uh, I uh, had I been here, I would have raised my hand with everybody else." But the official vote was fourteen zero one. Now, when I first learned of this story, I didn't believe it, and I you know I cross checked the story multiple times, and I did all sorts of archival research to make sure it was right. But I couldn't believe it because in e Memoirs Egypt. This would never fly. I mean, there would have been, there would have been, there would have been careers would have gotten destroyed over this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because Mubarak exists in a centralized arena. So mm -hmm. what that means is that the office of the executive, the all office power of the goes through him. Exactly. Uh -huh. Right. And so that's actually the sign of a fairly developed state. Right. Um, if you go back and you read things like you know John Strayer's on the medieval origins of uh -huh. the state. Right? And he talks about this like 300, 400, 500 year process of how a state becomes a state. What it essentially means is like executive control. That makes <laughs> sense. That makes sense. Egypt to me. has executive control and, and Syria doesn't. Um, Syria, the executive shares power with the institutions. And, and this is why, you know, the executive in Syria can't really alter the ruling coalition without some sort of violence because. The institutions are very weak, and, and altering the, the ruling coalition in Syria means that you're jeopardizing the regime because you're, you're injecting mm -hmm. a lot of, um, um, how do you, how, how should I say this, you're, you're injecting a lot of an uncertainty in the mm -hmm. elite arena, mm -hmm. whereas... As in nobody knows who's really in charge. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's power sharing, right? right? In Syria, it's more oligarchic than it is autocratic, whereas in Egypt, it's, it's sort of more typically autocratic. And I mean, look, this has been the way it is. I mean, Scaf's not sharing power. I mean, Scaf's mm -hmm. calling shots, and so, they're, they're dictating. So, so Bashar al-Assad derives his power not, not from his, his own leadership, but from a general agreement among the Ba'ath leaders and, and others that... Okay, we'll go along with you for the moment. Yeah, the military, the intelligence agencies. Like, I mean, this even came up in sort of you know the succession from when his father died, right? And and you know, there's there's these accounts like Patrick Seal's Acid Book, right? Where mm -hmm. where I mean, Patrick Seal basically paints Hafez al Assad the father mm -hmm. like he's this omnipotent, almost godlike creature. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that if we go back and we look at that, I mean, there was always a lot more power sharing than we would want to admit going mm -hmm. on in Syria. But mm -hmm. if you go back to the succession from the father to the son, right, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we have people on record, right, like the old minister of defense, uh, Mustafa Talas, says, you know, in an interview, like, right as it's going down, the succession's going on, like, well, we all went into the room and we decided, like, you know, Maybe one of us should take it because we all knew the former president and we knew what he wanted. Uh -huh. But then we kind of say, well, you know, if, that does, if we do that, you know, it, it's kind of unfair. And, you know, his father, he really did want Bashar, so maybe we'll just grant the father his wish and put the son in power. Right? And to me, that never sounded right. That sounded like they went into a room and they had a disagreement and said, you know, which one of us takes over? Mm -hmm. Well, if you take over, it jeopardizes this. If you, I take over, it jeopardizes this. Like, let's go get somebody that's not going to jeopardize our interests. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know... Um, installing and I had this installing the younger Assad then allows them to maintain the, the delicate balance of power. Absolutely. And I had this confirmed to me in various interviews when I was working in Damascus in uh, 03, 04, 05. Uh, and I also, you know, I mean, uh, when, when Abdelhalim Khaddam uh, was removed as vice president and he fled into exile in, in Paris, mm -hmm. and he gave a scathing interview in, in one of the Arabic uh, news channels, Al Arabeya, where he mm -hmm. basically said this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we were all sitting in the room and we and and we thought that we would destabilize it, so we just picked him. I want to go back to Egypt because you're talking about um, in the installation of Bashar al-Assad. You're talking about a moment in time when things could have changed, but they didn't really. Um, and in Egypt in 2011, we had this moment where things could have changed, but you're saying they didn't really. Now, during 2011 and during the the run up to the parliamentary elections, or at any other time, was there a moment when the liberals could have done something differently? that would have re resulted in a different outcome where we'd be having this other, this other conversation in another parallel universe where you're saying, yeah, I thought I knew what was going to happen in Egypt, but it turns out I was wrong. 
<laughs> uh, I mean, look, uh, I think that what we're witnessing in Egypt, in Syria, in Tunisia, in Yemen, in Bahrain, um, you know, these uprisings, I mean, they're, 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 um, we just, we just had a mayor of editorial board meeting and we were talking about this and these are unfinished processes, right? So by calling them uprisings or revolutions or, 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 or we're assuming that the ending is already done, right? Mm -hmm. Um, when, in the fact of the matter is, in the streets of Damascus, uh, or, or in the streets of Syria, and in, in the streets of Egypt, um, you know, these things are still being negotiated and fought and, you right. know, they're not done. Um, and so, you know, I think the, 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 the opportunity um, is always there that, that you know, um, the people could actually overthrow the regimes. Mm -hmm. But, but... I, I, I think that um, the way that this was all articulated in January and February in Egypt of 2011, they were so Mubarak-centric that they missed the regime. And, and I mean, now you get Egyptians saying this too, like, you know, we missed our moment, right? We should have stayed in the streets and, and made sure the generals left too. Uh -huh. um, and so I think that... Um, um, you know, the generals were able to kind of reconstitute the, the regime or try to reconstitute the regime. And um, I, I um, you know, the struggle is going to go on. But there's, there's many ways that we can look at this, right? Whether it's sort of, you know, the, the continuation of neoliberal reform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've seen the sort of um, the, the use of military trials, Mm -hmm. fly up, spike in Egypt in ways that, you know, Mubarak never abused these military trials like this. I mean, torture is still happening. Um, you know, violence is still happening. The, the security apparatus is unreformed. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of continuities. The, the state bureaucracy barely looks like it experienced some sort of upheaval. I mean, right. it, like it there's a lot of continuity. Yeah. Right? And so, I mean, I think that when we have these moments... Of, of of transition, right? And and I, I think it's an open-ended process and we're still going through it. But I think when we have these uh, moments of transition, there's this rush to kind of say, okay, okay, like how much changed? Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe the question say, okay, what's staying the same? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we can figure out what changed. So I, I think it's a different point of reference. And, and, you know, I mean, we're not the first region to go through this stuff, right? I mean, this stuff happened in these upheavals happened in Southeast Asia, like in Indonesia mm -hmm. in 1998. Um, you know, and then, of course, in Eastern Europe in 1989. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the Eastern European specialists, their advice to Middle Eastern specialists last year and, and this year <laughs> was that, you know, the problem was we were running after Democrats when we should have been watching the authoritarians and how they reconstitute themselves. Uh -huh. So, you know, and I mean, if you want to just take like a different example, right? So if you remember back a couple years um, in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. So there was this election and, and mm -hmm. you know, they poisoned the one guy. Yeah. The, the, right. I, you know, the Russians maybe poisoned him or something. Uh -huh. And the election came out as bogus and it led to the Orange Revolution. And then they got the guy to step down and then the poison guy took over. What's his name? Um, I can't remember his name. I remember who you're talking about, but I don't know. Yushchenko maybe? Is yeah, it? perhaps. He takes over as president, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the next election, this guy just got routed in the election. Uh -huh. And they elected the old people back in, mm -hmm. right? So there's these moments, right, where there's political change happening. But, I mean, uh, I think that we have to understand the continuities over time are likely to hold rather than, than sort of the, the massive change. I, I don't think that we kind of right. unveil a democracy or a transition to democracy. Final question. Uh, with what's happening in Syria right now, I mean, what, what are the questions that you are asking when you're reading the news, when you're following accounts of what's unfolding in homes or, um, or other places? I mean, what are you trying to figure out and what are you seeing happening? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I've been into conversations with people that know Syria far better than I do. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I really love Syria and I love doing research there. It's an incredibly difficult place, uh, you know, compared to Egypt. So, I mean, in many ways, I feel like a student of Syria all the time. Mm. Uh, in ways that I don't when I when I'm 
you know, conversing with, with colleagues and friends in Egypt mm -hmm. about Egyptian politics. And so, you know, I mean, the most, you know, the wisest sort of analysis I've heard so far has been that, you know, what we're actually witnessing is, is you know, regime breakdown in slow motion, right? So mm -hmm. um, um, the, the idea is that um, logistically the regime is having problems coordinating and in, in sort of moving its repression, right? And so that's why it doesn't always react to the uprisings as they're happening on the ground. Okay, the other thing with the opposition, right, is that no matter how dysfunctional or chaotic they can be at times, at the other side of that, they're also on a learning curve and they're learning, uh, there's a lot of political learning going on. So every day that they're involved in the fighting, they're getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So what you have are these trajectories where you have the regime sort of coming down mm -hmm. and the opposition going up. And I'm not saying that they're going to clash because I don't think they will. They're going to pass like ships in the night. Are we, so... So you think within, you know, you think that the next, well, what ha I mean, is there then a full-scale civil war in which the opposition emerges as the victor and there's a, there's a whole new thing built, a whole new regime built, or do you think that they just kind of pass each other and then we see the ruling class, the people who currently have the power, reestablish themselves in some new form? Maybe defect from the, the, you know, I mean, the problem is, you know, I mean, we're not seeing the defections. I mean, the, the defections in the newspaper are praised like they're major. But if you compare them to like what was going on in Libya when there were people like, you know, dozens of people defecting by the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's really not been that much in Syria. So I think that, um, you know, uh, if it stays on its current trajectory, it may take 18 months or it may take two years. But the regime can't go on like this forever. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of noise about all this, should we intervene, responsibility to protect. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, is that none of the regional parties or international parties that want to intervene in Syria are really all that concerned about Syrian civilians. Um, there's all sorts of other political uh, calculations being made, right? Mm -hmm. So in the Gulf and, you know, in the West, like they're very concerned, like, well, if we, you know, get rid of this regime, then we've isolated the Iranians, right? Or we've, mm -hmm. we've really stuck at the Hezbollah, right? And when you start making these sorts of calculations, then it's not really humanitarian. It's for your own political purposes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what you're going to probably get is some sort of dependent regime. Now, I mean, look, this, they're, they're, I mean, this isn't a done deal either, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, this conflict could get internationalized, uh, you, know, if, uh, um, you know, if Hezbollah starts a war with, with Israel, for instance. Right. All bets are off, right? Right. Because this would allow the Syrians room to kind of completely change the game, right? So, mm -hmm. And it's the Middle East, so there's lots of, uh, lots of variables that can, that can come into play. I got to get out of the sun. There's too much sun coming in my kitchen. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. The book is Adaptable Autocrats, Regime and Power, Regime Power in Egypt and Syria. It's uh, available at your, uh, at your local Amazon and your, maybe your local bookstore and definitely uh, somewhere in the city of Kent. Josh Stacker is the professor who wrote it. It's been great talking to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Dan.